we're looking at density independent factors and density dependent factors that regulate population growth. So here we have a field of dandelions and there are a lot of dandelions. So we would say this, is ha this has a high um, density. So let's look at density independent factors. These are things like really cold weather, for example. If you have a really, really cold winter, it's gonna kill off a lot of your, the snakes that live in the area. Whether you have a very small population or a big population, it's gonna affect the same, the snakes the same way. Similarly, if you have um, a hurricane and it hits an island, you're gonna kill most of the birds that live on an island if it's a really, really bad hurricane maybe, um, if there's not a lot of places for them to hide. And so that doesn't really doesn't matter if you have a few birds or a lot of birds. Um, so a lot of times these independent factors are things like weather. Density dependent factors depend on the size of the population. So birth rates and death rates change whether you have very few organisms around or whether you have lots and lots of organisms around. So an example of this might be the chipmunks that live in your yard. If you have lots and lots of chipmunks that live in your yard, you might have more hawks hanging around because they see lots of food around. And so they're gonna be killing off um, the chipmunks. Whereas if you only have a couple of chipmunks around, maybe the hawks don't hang around so much. Also, if one of the chipmunks gets sick, it's more likely to spread that disease to other chipmunks. Whereas if it were living in a really low density um, population, it might not be able to pass on the pathogen quite so easily. Here we have a graph of population density compared to birth or death rate per capita. Remember per capita means per individual. So here we have a very low population density, so very few organisms. And here is the birth and death rate versus a very high population. And oh, look, we have exactly the same birth and death rate. So this would be density independent. It doesn't matter if you have a very few um, organisms in the population or a very high population um, density. We've got that exact same birth and death rate. This one though is density dependent. So this is saying that if you have very, very few individuals, you um, have more births than deaths. M is mortality, which means death rate. So you have more babies being born if you have a very low population. If you have a very high population, it's the opposite. You actually probably have more death than you do birth. So that would be mortality is higher than birth rate. Density dependent population regulation. Again, this for this one, it matters whether you have very few organisms or whether you have lots of organisms. So for example, competition. Let's say you have um, some trees and if you have very a very dense group of trees, they're all competing for sunlight or maybe for the nitrogen that's in the soil. If you only have one tree in the area, well, it's getting all the sunlight it wants, right? So the more there are in the area, the more competition there is. Um, fighting for territory, territoriality is very similar to this. So if you don't have many um, individuals to fight with, then you have the territory that you want and your birth rates are going to be high. If you're fighting for your resources, then you're going to have to um, put a lot of energy into that and you're not going to have as many babies. Disease is another one that's density dependent. So if you live all by yourself, you're probably not as likely to come into contact with other folks of your species who are gonna make you sick. And if you do get sick, you're probably not gonna spread it to so many of them because there's not so many around. Predation, if you have um, that chipmunk example that I gave you earlier, if you have lots of chipmunks in the area, well, the hawks might notice that and hang out a lot more than they would if it was just you living there by yourself. Toxic waste, so Picture a petri dish of E. coli. They can only grow for so long before they have, um, before they've depleted their resources and made so many wastes that they're toxifying themselves and killing themselves off. And then intrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors are biotic, are life factors that have to do with the individual, kind of inside the individual. So these are genetic factors. So, for example, um, mice themselves will actually produce fewer babies if there's a lot of other mice living around. So they might wait a little bit longer till they're a little bit older and a little bit stronger before they start making babies. So these are genetic factors, but they're expressed differently depending on whether you have a low population or high population. And here's an example of that. So this is the percentage of young sheep producing lambs. So if you have a sheep that's a year old, it could uh, get pre pregnant and have a baby, um, but it would be a lot stronger and healthier if it waited a year. So 
if you have a very low population size, then 80% of those um, young sheep are going to produce lambs. But if you have a much higher population size for a certain area, you're going to have very, very few um, of the young sheep producing lambs. This is just one particular study. This is just showing you that in crowded populations, you have to fight more for the same resources, and that decreases birth rate because you're putting more energy into fighting than into making babies. This is uh, Nemo um, getting the um, aquarium really toxic. And so this is just to show you that uh, toxic waste can um, decrease the number of babies that you produce. These are some predators that are, are feeding on um, a particular species. And if you have a, one particular type of organism that gets really high in the population, the predators will feed on that more. Um, they'll target those a little bit more because they're just so easy to get. Here are the intrinsic factors. So if you have um, very, very few other, I don't know if these are mice, I think, I guess they are. If you have very, very few other mice in the area, you might produce a bigger litter. And if there are lots of other mice in the area, you might produce a smaller litter, which would be favored because you could put more resources into each baby and help each baby to get bigger. Um, competition for, for territory can, can, um, decrease the population, or at least the birth rate as well. So again, you're kind of putting more resources into fighting, and um, this can decrease the number of babies that you would typically make. This is showing pathogens that spread more rapidly. So there are, um, you're just more likely to get sick if you're in a big group. These are some studies of um, predator and prey. Here you have number of wolves and over here you have number of moose. So notice that you have different numbers on each of these axes, first of all. So at this line right here, we're looking at 30 wolves in, whoops, we're looking at 30 wolves in the area that we're, that we're studying versus 1,500 moose. So you don't have to have the same thing on each axis in order to look at the numbers and how they compare to each other. So this is time. And here in 1955, we have relatively uh, fewer moose than wolves. And again, we have way more wolves, right? So there's 500 wolves compared to, um, sorry, 500 um, moose compared to 20 wolves. But what we're looking at is the relative concentration. So as this one's going up, this one's going down. And then as this one goes up, this one starts to go down. So it's possible that these um, predator-prey relationships are linked in that way. Um, it might be that it's not a predator-prey relationship. It might be that there's a really harsh winter, for example, or that there are other predators in the area. So when you're looking at predator-prey relationships, it can be more complicated than um, what looks like a more obvious um, connection. Here's another example, um, the snowshoe hare with lynx. And so this is a, a lynx and they eat the snowshoe hares and they seem to kind of cycle together and this might have to do with, um, you know, if there's more snowshoe hair around, then there are more lynx that can, um, the lynx population will go up a little bit after because they have food. Um, so these boom bust cycles with the snowshoe hair might have to do more with how harsh the winter is and other predators, but the lynx might sort of follow the snowshoe hair um, pretty, pretty well. 